Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, today, I'm happy to welcome you to the Food Risk Predictions webinar. Um, my name is Neil Marshall, and I have the pleasure of being the moderator for today's session. We have an interesting uh, session for you today, very quite short and uh, concise, but hopefully we can share some good, interesting facts with you, particularly for people on the line and people who watch the recording, uh, for people who want to know more about risk predictions and how to manage that without having 25, 30 data science engineers within your own team. Next slide, please. So as, as I said, I'm Neil Marshall, Managing Director of my own private consulting company now. Uh, previously, as people may know me from my roles at Coca-Cola uh, for 20 plus years. Um, I have the pleasure today of welcoming Kelsey Robson from ABP Food Group and Mihailis Papakonstantinou from Agrono. Apologies for I just uh, butchered your pronunciation there, but my Greek is not as good as my English. Uh, for Kelsey, I've just been uh, talking to her again recently, but she has a very impressive background. Uh, uh, research studies have taken her from PhD to master's to BSc from Seattle to the prestigious colleges of University College of Dublin, and also then a recent PhD at Queen's University in Belfast, where she majored on agri-food and land use. So very pleased to have Kelsey with us to share our insights from ABP. And Mihailis is really uh, becoming a close friend of mine now, as he supports us so often on the data and information and educating us and leading his team at Agrino on how he discovers all these insights from the data, and from the analysis that's been done by that team. Um, Mihailis is also very well educated with a master's degree and a BSc from a prestigious university in Athens. And he is really what I would call the brains behind the platform, uh, along with Yanis. And um, he leads a team of engineers who help uh, interrogate that data and create the uh, right information for the customers. Next slide, please. Okay, so the goal from today, what is it? Well, we really want to try and, as I said in the, in the last slide, take you through the risk predictions and how you can do that and what tools you need to, to assess that data. You know, there's so much information out there but you need to be able to interpret that data. And how do you interpret it? Well, you need a tool like we're gonna show you today, but it's the best way without having a load of people on your staff with a lot of cost. But you need to be able to interpret and look for the right data. So that's also critical. Next slide, please. So where are we? I mean, one of the big challenges we're all facing now is, is the whole uh, position of consumer trust. Consumers, if you see on the left side of the slide there, you can see that not everybody is trusted in the same way. And people generally would go for, in, in the order of preference there, first to the internet, then trust in probably the big companies and food business operators. But the most trusted people from a consumer perspective, and obviously this can still vary by different markets, is the government and the regulators. So one thing that we've been doing uh, closely with Agra now is working with these regulators as well and with academia and with industry to also get the right insights to use the data. Because if you look then to the right hand side of the slide, unfortunately, we still get too many food safety uh, incidents from recalls and where people become ill or sick from eating um, incorrect food and 17% of the world's population is still way too much. And everybody's intention is obviously try to drive that down much more. Next slide, please. So why are we really talking today about risk prediction? And risk prediction to me is the new way forward. We need to be much more inclusive of that information and use it much more to drive decision-making uh, for the future. Industry tells us, you know, obviously from my own personal experience, we're always trying to avoid a recall. We don't want to pull product back. It's very costly. 
it's time consuming and obviously it gives a bad image to the companies who are doing it and the, and the industry. If you have a recall in, in a dairy company, it's going to affect the whole sector. It's not just one company. So we need to be more proactive where we can. And obviously everyone's trying to be proactive, but you end up being reactive because you're always chasing your tail if you're not careful. So one phrase that I use quite a lot is in that prevention area, is trying to see around corners. So to see the future and how can we do that? Well, we need tools and we need to use technology. On the right side, again, you can see, you know, there's so much data out there and Mihailis can help us in interrogate that further later. You have so much information, it's hard to know which bit to use. And how can you see, you know, another English expression, the wood from the trees, how do you know what's important? And how can you use that data to your advantage? But the biggest point as well is when you're not investigating and following up and managing recalls, which is spending a lot of money on, you have the opportunity to be more proactive and save money and invest in different ways. And one way to do that in a much more beneficial way is to invest that money in technology to use and interrogate that data. Next slide, please. So again, everything needs to be around science. And I talked before about technology. Technology can't work properly without people. So you need people to interrogate the data and you need to be based on the scientific evidence that drives you to the right conclusions. Next slide, please. And as we said, you know, the data gets so complicated now and, and in, in the platform that we'll talk about and with Kelsey, there's so much information. It's difficult to know which piece to use and which piece not to use. You're doing your risk assessment, you're doing hazard analysis, you're looking at your suppliers, you're looking everywhere, but how can you avoid those recalls? And some of the things that are coming out, you know, I steal some of this information from a recent conversation I had with uh, Chris Elliott at Queen's University as well. You know, one of the big things that Chris was mentioning is the next risk for, for the food industry and the world, basically, is around climate change and the sustainability ch challenges that are coming. We've all just lived through the pandemic of COVID for the last 12 months. But how many food uh, issues have occurred? Well, probably less. There's been less recalls but by numbers in the last 12 months. But why is that? Are we just storing up problems for the future? No, no one really knows yet, but it's probably likely there will be a spike in events coming forward. So we need to learn from the past to look forward. So always looking back in the rear view mirror is not the right approach. We need to be more forward thinking. Next slide, please. Yeah, and, and, the, and the whole point around information is, is what you do with that information. And how do you get the right information? How do you know you've got the right information? What are the, right, what are the countries or suppliers that pose you most risks? And every company has a different situation. Everybody has different uh, lenses, which they use to interpret that data. And uh, experience obviously helps in some of these cases. But the biggest thing we need to move towards, and I would suggest we need to strongly move towards, is the use of data and technology to inform those decisions. Next slide, please. So one of those things, again, I mentioned Chris, and I was talking to Chris again actually yesterday, uh, is the digital crystal ball. So we've coined that phrase between us. Uh, this is how do we use technology to look forward into the future? Next slide, please. And that's a critical point for us to use that data, to use technology and that digital crystal ball to interpret the information. You need to be able to have a simple dashboard where you can assess those risks, look at the different countries, capture it into one place. What better than to go to one place every morning, check on you as you log onto your laptop, look in one place to see all that information. I know in my case, in my previous role, that's what I like to do. I like to see everything, review it, move on, allocate the work out to the people that need to look at it. But you need to use that data and that interpretation to be constantly checking and wherever possible, 
we need to automate those approaches so it's not relying on people and experience. It needs to be built into an exacting process that looks through the data using predictive analytics and the technology behind it and the AI with the algorithms to make sure we are using predictive science to look for the risks ahead. So in this webinar, we're gonna talk about that more and get some practical experience from, from Kelsey, from her experience at ABP. And also then Miles is gonna take us through some details and analysis, and then also a demonstration of the Food Archive uh, solution. So next slide, please. I think we have a poll, yes. Just before I pass to Kelsey, we'd just like to ask you to answer the poll, please, online. Click one of the responses, and then we'll incorporate that into the answers later on and share the feedback. Okay, next slide. So I think at that point, I'm now gonna hand over to Kelsey. Okay, sorry, before we get <laughs> quickly, we've got the responses. So we have the responses. So maybe this is a question into you, Kelsey. So let's just have a look, what do we get? We get probably 40, 46% saying merging risks for ingredients is a thing that most people want to see along with the supplier, so it's a joint tie. So I don't know about you, Kelsey, so what would you like a crystal ball for to see the risks at ABP? Maybe that's a nice intro for you for your first answer. And good morning, good afternoon. Yes, <laughs> that's a good segue. Um, hello everyone, I'm Kelsey Robson again. I work with ABP, a beef manufacturer, uh, primarily located in Ireland and UK. And we have been involved with Agrino for probably the last six months, working on a project in predictive analytics because we do see a lot of value in knowing what's next, what are the emerging risks, what suppliers, what areas are issues gonna come up in. and the big question is just where do we need to focus our resources? Um, how can we act proactively, particularly when it comes to food fraud, where there's so many unknowns? Um, where can we manipulate our mitigation and prevention techniques and testing so that we are the most prepared for any upcoming issues? whatever they may be. And if we have a crystal ball to tell us, focus all your testing or focus more of your testing in this area, that would be so helpful in how we can approach emerging threats and emerging hazards. So next slide, please. So um, then going into what we want to achieve with this project. And there are a lot of different things, a lot of different factors we hope to achieve. I think we've what we, why we got involved are the big picture issues. We want a crystal ball, we wanna know the emerging risks. But then there are a lot of little questions to get there. Again, what factors contribute to food fraud? Do we need to look at prices and trade and climate change and um, changes in legislation? How do those factors contribute to risk? And also how do those factors interact with each other? And based off of those interactions, can we get that crystal ball to see what types of food fraud are coming next? What are the emerging hazards in our supply chain? If there's a climate issue, is that going to cause more substitution issues or is that going to cause more issues in um, mislabeling things, traceability? So having all that information in one location where we could quickly look at it and don't need teams of people to sort through horizon scanning and media mining, but have it in one area where we can quickly see patterns occurring and know what those patterns mean and some algorithm that tells us this is the hazard coming, it's coming in six months time or it's coming in a year's time so that we can adjust our testing methods to, in, to protect our supply base. So overall, we just hope that working with Agrino can give us this crystal ball and help us where to help us mitigate these issues. So next slide, please. 
So that brings me to our last point, what value do we see? And the value is knowing where the issues are coming so that we can adjust our mitigation techniques and keep our supply chain and our supply base safe from any upcoming hazards and any upcoming threats to our supply base from around the world. So thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a delay with the technology here. So I didn't mention at the beginning, I'm here in the US. Kelsey's obviously in the island. And then the Agrino team are in Athens. So we're bridging all different time zones and continents here. So that's that's a good thing. And that's the reason also we're doing next slide, please. Sorry, just so people know this. We, we don't want too much of a delay. Uh, thank you again, Kelsey. Interesting insight. So maybe now we can segue to Mihalis. Uh, and he can tell us now more how can technology help us and how did it help you with um, ABP? So, Mihalis. Perfect. I thank you very much, Neil, for the introduction. And by the way, congratulations on the attempt to pronounce my last name. I know it's <laughs> the Greek one, so. <laughs> thank you. I, now, in order to talk about how technology can help us, uh, perhaps we can start with a bit of an introduction into Agrano, so if we move on to the next slide. Who are we? Who is Agrano? Uh, we are the food safety intelligence company, and what we want to do is that we want to predict food risk in order to make prevention a data informed decision. And if we move on to the next slide, I, now more specifically, the reason and uh, the reason behind what we want to do and what we want to accomplish is that we want to empower uh, food safety professionals out there to help them with data insights in order to, to help us gain access to safer and healthier food. And if we will move on uh, to the next slide now, the main reason and we're talking about data a lot here. So it's actually one of the reasons that companies turn to Agrano and one of the reasons that actually we got in contact with uh, ABP and uh, Kelsey's team. They get in contact with us because we're a data company. We know about data. We've been doing data for quite some time now. And they turn to us because, okay, as you most probably, the ones in the audience know this better than me, that the food safety sector is a sector that deals with various data types. Many, many different data types. We have food records, we have border rejections, we have trade data, production data. There are millions and millions of data points out there, and all of them are in a multilingual way, in various languages, various formats. They are highly heterogeneous data points. So what we know how to do and what we've been doing over the past uh, year is that we attempt to make sense of this data, collect, transform, and translate this data and them to make sense of them and help the companies that turn to us in this way. If we move on to the next slide, now, how do we help them? We have two offerings here. On the one side, on the left side, you can see Fudakai, our software as a service solution, and this solution focused on risk assessment and prediction. And by talking about risk assessment, we're collecting data going back many years. We perform risk assessment on ingredients, on hazards, on countries and continents, but we move it a step further and you will see this in a little while during the interactive demo, we move also to a, predicted, to a predicted state. So we know what has happened in the past. Can we use this data in order to attempt to predict what will take place over the next 12 months? And this is a software as a service solution, but as we mentioned previously, we're also heavily dependent on data. We've been doing data for quite some time. So uh, there wouldn't, they, we should have a data as a service solution then this is what you see on the right of your screen, it's got data. And now this is our data as a service solution. This was actually announced today, just a couple of hours ago by our CTO in a previous session. And it's data as a service concerning food safety and food risk. And this is what we offer. But if we move on to the next slide, now this is just a quick overview as far as the data points that we collect and process. And keep in mind that these data records that you see, as you can see, there are millions of them. These are data records that are constantly evolving. So over every five minutes, we are collecting data from the sources that we keep track of. And you can see here an overview as far as the number of sources that we keep track of. You see the global coverage of this data, almost the whole world is covered. And the last point here is the data types. Now, this is something really interesting. And again, I'm sure that many in the audience know this way better than me, that the food safety sector 
has a lot of different uh, data types. This is the variety as far as big data is concerned, but we have many data types. And if we move on to the next slide, we get just a quick overview as far as the data types involved and collected uh, in our systems. So apart from food recalls and border rejections, you can see that there are also lab tests. There are search or readings coming from uh, farms who have production data, trade data, social media data, food safety news announced on websites all around the world. Uh, Kelsey mentioned before uh, legislation pieces and the respective updates, MRA limits, inspections on common prices, and so on. And you can see here just a quick overview as far as the overall numbers are concerned. If we move on to the next slide, now let's turn our attention to the tailor-made prediction case study that we did with Kelsey and her team. And if we go on, let's start with what we wanted to answer there. And the main question was that, okay, we mentioned the variety of data types in the food safety sector. How, which of them play an important factor in order to be able to predict what will take place in the future? So we have all these data points, they are, they are of various types. Can we identify which of them will take place? So it will help us understand what will take place in the future. So we have the business question, then we have to choose the data. And in this case, although we experimented a lot and uh, Kelsey's and her team's suggestions actually proved valuable to this, we identified the following data types that were of help in order to predict what will happen. We involved incidents in this case, lab results, production data, trade data, and price data. And bear in mind that this specific tailor-made use case that we did with uh, Kelly's and her team was in order to be able to predict food fraud cases happening in beef uh, in the future. So we have the data, we have the question, we have what we want to accomplish. And of course, the missing piece would be to identify the prediction method we will use in order to do this. And this is just to give you a quick overview uh, as far as the this use case is concerned. And now what we did is that we deployed, we trained and deployed a dedicated model, a dedicated machine learning model for the case of IDP in this tailor-made uh, tool that we developed. Now, of course, since uh, this is actually tailor-made to ABP's case, we are unable to show a live demo, but we have here a quick overview on the image on the right. You can see the various factors and how they, 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 they are uh, shown in this chart here, in the various colors. And the specific case that we used as an evaluation step was actually a fraud outbreak involving Brazilian beef back in 2017. There are various things we can talk about, but please bear in mind uh, that the approach that we used in this case actually was a correlation one. So mainly you can understand this as inputting many different data types, many different features as we call them within machine learning, identifying the correlation, how does one affect the other in order to be able to a, assess what will, how many incidents will take place over the next months, and how will this affect the risk assessment for, a, in this case, a fraud happening in beef? Again, I'm mentioning here that this is a specific tailor-made use case. And uh, for those that really like numbers, you can see a quick overview as far as to the actual data records involved in this uh, specific use case. So you can see here that apart from fraud cases on beef, the other data types are actually in the scope of millions of records on, or hundreds of thousands of records. And if we move on to the next slide now, this is what we did as far as um, the case, the tailor-made case for ABP. However, as we mentioned, this is a tailor-made case. So we worked heavily over the past six months with, with Kelsey and her team, identifying new, rec new data records, new data sources, and running and rerunning, training and retraining our models in order to be able to have a production grade version available. This is one thing. And on the other side, we have Fudakai. Now, this is accessible to all. This is, as we mentioned, our software as a service solution. And it's a food risk prediction platform. And what we do, if we move on to the next slide, by using Fudakai, we 
we have a promise to our end users that what we do is that we provide risk predictions for all and this is available to every user of Fudakai, the prediction part that we will see during the, interact the interactive demo in a little while. And in this case, we are covering all the, the important ingredients throughout everyone's supply chain. If we move on to the next slide, now how do we do this? How does this risk prediction take place? It's split into various steps. Of course, on the first step, we have the risk identification part. We have to identify what is the, the risk that will take place. And this is split into a, on either an ingredient level or on supplier level. Because, of course, in this case, counters of origin play a different factor. And, of course, the end game is to actually be able to inform our, user, our users before something takes place in their supply chain and alert them previously so they can perform some um, remedial steps. We move on to the next slide. Now, as far as the first step of the risk identification, now this is where the data comes in. We collect data, and as we mentioned before, we collect them every five minutes. And these data are global food safety data, food recalls and border rejections happening on the market level. And by having access to this data, we're able to identify emerging hazards. So which ingredient is, so, is showing an increasing tendency in terms of number of incidents or for specific uh, hazards. And then in this data, we also have available suppliers, name of the food companies that have either manufactured the recalled ingredient that may have uh, imported the recalled ingredient, packaged it. So we have information of food companies. So the, the way that we use this data in order to evaluate the supplier is that we take this into account and we are able to perform supplier assessment on top. So if we move on to the next part, now how, how does this help? And how does all of this all, all of this collection of data help in order to identify risk? We have pointed out here four specific cases. And on the, uh, we have fibronyl next, but in 2017, the ethylene oxide outbreak, Prochloras mandarin in mandarins and oranges, and the latest in peppercorn. So these were all caught by our scanning part of the solution. If we move, if we move on to the next uh, step, now. If we move on to the next slide, please. Perfect. So now having access to all this data, we're able to perform the risk assessment. And using this data, we can identify what is the risk value of a specific ingredient. And if we move on to the next step, then we can perform the actual prediction on top. So having all this data, performing the analysis, we are able to, to attempt to predict what will take place in the future. Next slide, please. And this is what is covered by Fudakai. Now, uh, during the interactive demo, we will uh, show you the prediction dashboard, but just a quick overview as far as the other functionalities of Fudakai. They have to do with the scanning part. So we are constantly monitoring for new cases happening worldwide, and we alert our end users for them. We identify emerging hazards and perform the respective analysis, perform supplier evaluation, we, we allow our users to perform reporting in an automated way. We collect and allow these insights available in the, the global lab test insights are available within our system. And as mentioned in the previous slides, the risk assessment and the risk prediction part are all available there. I think it's time for a... Yeah, thank you, Matt. This yeah, is good. So I think one of the things before we go to a demo is, you know, it's just to summarize there are many there are many assets and points available within the platform you can see the seven items there so you know there's a quick poll question now again please if you could just submit your answer which of the Fudakai modules would you more interested in and be more valuable to you and then after we just get the quick response i'm going to give Miles a little bit of a challenge and he's going to give us a bit of a 15 minute demo, so it won't be too hard. I, for, for Yanis, I like to give him really hard questions. So I'm, I'm more friendly with you, Miles, so I'll give you easy one. <laughs> Perfect. I hope, Yanis is I hope Yanis is listening as well, by the way. So um, what do we get? Do we get the answer, Just if any? A few more minutes, seconds, sorry. 
There we go. So what do we have, Yanis? We have risk prediction. What a surprise. That's always mine as well, but usually there's also a close tie between supplier evaluation as well. So maybe if you can look at that, and I know from the polling and discussions earlier, uh, from the feedback, people are looking for information around peanuts, Nihilus. So maybe if you can do a deep dive in the demo into peanuts, and then how could that help us with the risk ranking? I think that would be useful. So over to you for the demo. I might jump in at some point and ask you some questions. So just to keep you on your toes. Feel free to do so. <laughs> okay. I, now let me quickly share my screen. I, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Perfect. Yes. Uh, so before we go into the actual prediction and more specifically, we will use opinions for this. Let me quickly mention at this point that the prediction dashboard within Fudakai, along with mostly um, almost all of our other modules available, are actually customizable. So everything you see in this prediction dashboard is based on choices I've made and each user has made under the customization step. So in this case, I have created a red preference, prediction preference, that involves as a country India and the specific ingredients, cereals, peanuts, ice cream, and ginger. But enough with the overview, let's dive into the actual predictions. Now I'm switching over modules and just clicking on the prediction dashboard. And as you can see, the selected ingredients under the customization step are available here. Now, Neil, as you very much correctly mentioned, uh, we had a poll previously and peanuts was the ingredients, the ingredient that actually draw the attention from uh, most of the attendants here within within our system and in this webinar. So I'm selecting peanuts in this case. And let's dive into what is available in our, um, risk, in our risk prediction dashboard. Now, first up, we have a quick overview as far as the total number of incidents go for peanuts. So mainly what we do here and the overall approach, let me just quickly mention this again. We have data going back 40 years. And the main idea is that can we, can we use this data? Can we take advantage of the seasonality behind all these time series involving ingredients, involving different, different hazards or different countries? Can we take advantage of all these trending and seasonality and be able to train models, train dedicated models for each ingredient and hazard in order to identify what will take place over the next 12 months? And what do you see here? are actually the results of our most accurate uh, predictive capabilities, so predictive models. So going back to the actual dashboard, a quick overview as far as the total number of incidents. What took place in the last 12 months? What our most accurate models believe will take place over the next 12 months? And what is the expected tendency? And if we move on to the chart on the right, Okay, so we know 133 cases will take place for peanuts based on our most accurate models. But how, but how are these cases spread throughout the next 12 months? And you can see this on the chart here. If you hover on any of the points on the red dot, on the yellow dotted line, you can see their respective values. So, okay, we've got a quick overview. Can we dive in deeper? which are the specific hazards that are likely to increase based on the outcomes of our most accurate models. And this is what we attempt to identify in the next table available here. We are still looking into peanuts and we dive in deeper. So what will take place for peanuts? What are the hazards that are likely to increase over the next 12 months? And in this case, we have mycotoxin and aflatoxin, no surprise there. But also the cases of pesticides or absence of health certificates are also available. And again, what signified here is what took place in the last 12 months and what, what our most accurate models believe will take place over the next, for instance, for the first line, specifically for mycotoxin appearing in peanuts. And if, if we have this knowledge, if we have this estimation, as far as to what we believe will take place over the next 12 months, then we can also perform risk assessment in the future. So this is what we signify with this blog on the right. The current snapshot under the actual tab, we have the current snapshot of the risk. 
So you can see it here in a color way based on Fudakai's risk assessment formula. What is the actual, the current snapshot of risk for peanuts? And how will this value evolve over the next 12 months based on the prediction we've made? And you can see some numbers and expect the values uh, changing here. And now that we tapped into risk, how will this evolve? Because keep in mind that what we do is on a monthly basis. So we're talking about 12 months into the future as far as incidents are concerned and on a hazard level. And the same thing we're also doing for the risk. So you can see here on the next chart, the risk evolution for the risk assessment of peanuts over the next 12 months on a monthly basis. And a quick overview as far as to when the sharpest increase will take place over the next months. Now, as we mentioned, the FUDACA is a, a full customizable uh, system. So in case you've added the product recipe that involves this ingredient, you will see it appearing here along with the estimated risk in the future. Other products, other ingredients uh, throughout the respective vocabulary that we use that will be affected by the, the prevalent hazard. And finally, and this is where the, the country of interest that was chosen under the customization step comes into play as far as predictions are concerned. We have a, a, distribution, a, a distribution as far as the predicted number of cases for the country or continent of interest, in this case India. What are most accurate models believe will take place over the next 12 months as opposed to what has taken place over the past 12 months? And this actually concludes the part of the prediction, the prediction dashboard. And I believe, Neil, you mentioned that the second result had to do with the supplier evaluation. Or, or yes, that? yeah, yes, also. So yeah, maybe you can dig into the supplier piece and show us, show us that as well, Miles. I think that's really interesting how you can click down and follow the trends and use that. But I think the other point to explain is the supplier uh, assessment piece you can also use in the dashboard. Indeed, I, however, and we were actually prepared for this just in case this module uh, scored highest. As you can understand for anonymity purposes, although what you see are screens are taken from our system directly, unfortunately for anonymity purposes, we're not able to, we do not want to show you a specific food company. So we will do this in an anonymous way uh, over the next slides. Now, this is and not but I think that's a good point, though, Miles, as well. You know, what, especially when you talked about the data feed as well, the API. You know, individual companies' data is secure. It's all in the cloud, and it's segregated from other people. All your other information is anonymized in. But if you were a user, if I, if it was my company, I wanted to go in and enter my supply names in here. You can do that, yeah? I know you can't show it now because for confidentiality, but you can enter information there and you can pull out specific information about current suppliers or future suppliers. Sorry, I'm doing your demo for you. No, there. No, no. And then you giving the information. information. Yeah, I'm giving the information about, you know, if I want to source from that supplier in India, what are their previous issues? Can I pull information from the system that I wouldn't be able to find from the normal Google? So maybe you can just talk to that as well a little bit. How do you get that? And how do you then ensure it's correct, the data? What do you and your team do to make sure it's right? That's an excellent point, uh, Neil. And this is why we've actually, uh, now the slide you're currently seeing is a screenshot taken from our system. What we want to do is give our users a Google-like look and feel and be able for them to search throughout our database for any kind of supplier they want. So in this case, we're just searching for supplier A. And as I'm sure you can understand, uh, the name of food company may appear in various formats. So in this case, we're searching for supplier A, but country A is referring to it as supplier A incorporated or LLC or many other various names. So what we do in order for our system to respond with a respective results, what we do is that we aggregate this information together. So this information may be alternative names, how well the food company is called throughout the world, but also we collect information about subsidiaries. So by searching for a specific supplier, you can actually go over and see information that also aggregates information coming from their subsidiaries. And this is what we showcase over the next slide. So this is how you can search for a supplier. 
just by clicking on the supply and check, you access all of the data that we have collected going back 40 years in total. Under the My Suppliers tab, we can perform specific assessment uh, for specific suppliers. And if we move on to the next one, we can create a, a live risk profile based on the data that we have collected for supplier A in this case. And you are seeing a, a respective screenshot from the supply profile of supplier A. And if we move on, what else is available here is that let's say you've inputted many suppliers and you want to get a quick overview as far as a risk is concerned for these suppliers. We have a dedicated dashboard for this. This is where all the suppliers you've added under the My Suppliers tab, under the customization phase, you will see them appearing here as supplier A, B, C, and so on. And you will see various factors coming into play. So we have incidence risk, ingredients risk, boundary risk, recalled border rejections, inspections, warning letters, and so on. And you can also add your own data, as Nick very much correctly mentioned. You can add your own data that will actually be dedicated to your instance of uh, Fudakai. And if we move on, by adding your data, you can change also the weights and how we calculate the risk uh, for its supply. And this is all cases in this slide. And moving on, and Neil, going back to you in this case. Yeah, thank you, Niles. Yeah, so obviously we can't show everything as clearly as we'd like to. Uh, I think one thing to just be aware of, you know, you can obviously follow up separately and I'll give you a, a name and a contact in a minute. But just to summarize and, and just go through what we've talked about, basically there's three different options uh, that you can choose from to, to select with the Food Akai package from the starting to premium to diamond and different features are included. Obviously it's all there, but the pricing uh, depends upon which elements you need and which are most suitable to you. And I think next slide, please. And the, the point really from that is, you know, if you want to get a risk prediction plan customized to you, please follow the link, uh, capture that link or use the QR code and contact uh, Anna at the team and the customer team at Agrino. But I think just, just to summarize, because I think we're running out of time as always seems the case with these uh, webinars. You know, we, we've had an interesting overview from the demo from the tool from Ailis. We heard from Kelsey and thank you again for your insights on how you started to work with Agrino from ABP and particularly around the beef risks and the food fraud issues uh, to mitigate those for your company. And then I shared some insights from my side about how I have used uh, the platform both in previous roles and also now uh, working with Agrino to further develop and enhance the tool. I think if you want to use your digital crystal ball to get more data, to automate your processes, to take away some of that manual risk assessment uh, that you're having to do by people, and you want to prevent some of that investment and chasing down recalls and, and reacting afterwards, we need to use the data more to enhance the, the processes and use that data, science-based data, to make predictions for the future. And this is a great platform and a great tool to help you do that. And I think my final just comments really about Agrono as a company and Nikos, uh, the CEO and his team, they are really agile. Agile in a good way that they adjust. They're very keen to help and learn and work with you. As, as uh, Mihailis mentioned there before, you know, Yanis <laughs> announced at the GFSI conference this morning about the API risk of data approach, the new, new solution. They're always coming up with innovations to help and enhance, but innovations that could help you do your, do your work better and enable your business. And the whole use of digitized technology is critical for the future for the food industry. So I would say, you know, contact AgriNow, use this number and use data for yourselves. But thank you again. Uh, we'll answer the questions that came up in the chat. I think Anna's already answered some of those already, but we'll follow up with any questions specifically because I know we're out of time now. But thank you, Miles. Thank you, Kelsey. And thank you to the team. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. And thank you everyone for attending. Thanks for attending, yeah, thank you.